I'm always amazed by sometimes the simplest of things. When was the last time that you were amazed by something? You know, when you looked at it and you said, wow. Maybe couldn't figure it out or were just overwhelmed by what it was. Uh, Friday, uh, excuse me, Thursday, I was traveling through the, the mountains of Kentucky. Got up early before the sun came up to travel up to Buckhorn. And as I was coming across the, the newly opened road, those of you that have been uh, going to Buckhorn will be amazed that, that, that the newly opened road is open. We used to have to go down this curvy little road and it'd take us 45 minutes to get, from, uh, to get from London, Kentucky to Boonville, Kentucky. And it was, it was always fun in a van because the people in the back row were throwing up and people were going to sleep to keep from getting motion. It was just an amazing trip. But, but the road I thought was going to be a big four-lane road, but it wasn't. It was just two lanes, but it was straight. And, and just being straight made all the difference in the world. It took me 20 minutes to get from London, Kentucky into, into Boonville, which was right there as you go up the mountain to, to Buckhorn. But the, the sun was coming up. Beautiful. I just, it was just a beautiful experience. It's hard to explain it to folks. I'm sure you've seen a sunrise. And I'm sure, I'm sure that you've seen a sunset. And I'm sure that you have seen mountains. All of you have. But for me, in that moment, in that period of time, in that experience, it was amazing. I would have gotten out and taken a picture of it, but have you ever taken a picture of a sunrise and then go home and say, what's that? The picture just, the picture just doesn't have the same effect, does it? My mother had a lot of pictures that when she died, I was going through, and she had all these pictures of mountains and valleys and sunrises and sunsets and none of them did a thing for me I just threw them away it wasn't a memory that I had it wasn't the experience of the moment that I was having that it meant absolutely nothing and I imagine if you were to ask my mom where did you take this picture she would have said I don't know what vacation were you on when you took this picture? I don't know. What state were you in? I don't know. And at one point in her life, you could ask her what planet she was on, and she would say, I don't know. It just didn't have a real meaningful impact. What kind of experiences change our lives? What kind of experiences in our spiritual life so impact us that, that we are changed, we go in a new direction, we see things differently, and we never, ever, ever forget the experience. How far into Peter's life do you think we went before Peter said, or you asked Peter, what was the most meaningful experience in your life? And he couldn't remember this experience of filling his boat with fish. He had been a fisherman all of his life. He had caught fish before, and he probably had some pretty good catches at times. That's how he made his living. But this was such an experience that when it was through, Peter, Simon Peter, was never the same ever again. I got a feeling that if you ask Peter about his experiences in life, and you said, Peter, what experience has changed your life? I think the first one he's going to say is that day that Jesus got in my boat, he talked to the people, then he put us out onto the, onto the sea, he spoke a little bit more, and then he said for me to go to deep water. And I put out my nets, and I've never caught fish like that before in my life. And then as you turn and walk away and say, whoa, 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 there's more. Let me tell you about the time that Jesus invited me to step out of my boat and walk on the water. And you hear that experience. And then you turn to walk away, and Peter said, whoa, 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 there's more. Let me tell you about the time that I ran to the tomb, and it was empty. I saw him die. I knew that he was dead. They buried him. Let me tell you about the time that John and I ran to the tomb and it was wide open. 
And then you turn to walk off. You, whoa, 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 whoa. There's more. Let me tell you about the time that me and the boys were all hiding away because we were afraid of the Roman soldiers and the room just lit up. Darkness in the room was driven out and there he was standing right in front of us. And so you'd turn to walk off and you'd go, whoa, 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 there's more. Let me tell you about the time that I was out fishing. And I looked up at the beach, and there was a fire, and somebody was cooking fish. And when as I got closer, I recognized it. It was Jesus. And I got out of the boat, and I swam to the shore, and he had breakfast prepared for us, and we ate fish. And then he said to me, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. Peter, do you love me? And by the way, I was getting a little aggravated at that point. Yes, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. And then you turn to walk away, and he says, wait a minute. I got to tell you the rest of it. He told me on that day, that they would come one day and bind me up. And that they would take me where I didn't want to go. And that I would follow in his death. And everybody would, you, you probably kind of think, wow, that doesn't, that doesn't sound real good. I mean, the fish story is pretty good. The walking on the water is really an interesting one. That idea that you saw an empty tomb, that's even greater. And you saw the resurrected Jesus. But why are you saying that one? He said, it changed my life. Everything I did became urgent. I knew that if I was going to do anything at all, it would be in a short period of time that I wasn't going to be a pastor of the First Baptist Church for all eternity. I knew that what I needed to do, I only had a short period of time to do it. And I focused on what was important I want you to stand amazed not because you've had a good experience in your life somewhere I want you to stand amazed in the presence of the one who changes our direction who changes our lives who encourages us to use with urgency the gifts and the talents that we have in this story I picked up three things that a couple months ago I jotted down and began to develop a little bit but I kind of think that they were this, this idea that they were all sitting there and they were, they were just mending their nets. Their nets weren't in use. They were taking care of their nets. They were washing their nets. They were doing all kinds of things. And a crowd had gathered around Jesus because they were listening to the word of God. Now I want to I pause right there because I need, need for you to understand this. When Jesus was preaching there on the seashore, did he have everybody sit down and say, okay, everybody open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verse, verse, chapter 5. No, there wasn't one. Did he say to them, okay, y'all open your scrolls to the prophet Isaiah? No, those scrolls were huge. You didn't carry them with you. They were at the synagogues and in the temple. And when you heard scripture read, you would go there to have it read. Nobody ever said let's let's read from the word of god today no who's speaking the one that the scripture says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word became flesh and dwelt among us where's the word of god coming from from the mouth of the messenger jesus is the man who has come into our world to proclaim the word or the communication or what God is speaking into the lives of people. And they were amazed at what he was teaching. We're not talking about just anybody here. We're talking about the Messiah. We're talking about the one who later on the church would acknowledge without any reservation as the Son of God. The miracle worker. 
the one who provided, the one who was our Savior, the one who was our sacrifice, and all of that terminology that we might use to talk about Jesus becomes reality in our lives. But how did it begin? He simply began speaking the word of God. And they were mending their nets, washing their nets, repairing their nets, doing the things that were preparing them for the next day of fishing. I think there's a lot of times when we waste our nets, and I want us to hear this today. I think we spend a lot of time wasting what God has given to us, our nets. Sometimes it's in defeat, and that story seems to be here. We fished all night. Can you hear Peter telling that story? Can you hear Peter when Jesus gets in the boat and says, hey, let's go fishing, and Peter says, well, <laughs> we fished all night. We ain't caught nothing. Ain't no fish in that lake. We've fished out all the spots. We've gone to all the places that are usually good for us to catch fish. We're good, skilled fishermen, and they just aren't catching today. And they were all defeated. Sometimes the church lives in a defeated mode. We worked all day and caught no fish. We've worked all year, caught no fish. We've worked and worked and worked and worked, and we're just in this defeated mode that we're not filling the boats with fish. William Carey, one of the first missionaries ever to go to India, had to fight to get support to go there. God one day said, William Carey, we're going to send you to India to serve as a missionary. And he accepted that call, and he began to raise money and he went to Baptist churches and he said, God's called me to be a missionary. And, the, and the, the story says that he would pass around a snuff can. And they'd put change in the snuff can. But most Baptists didn't think that God would call anybody to go anywhere else. And their statement was this, if God wanted to save the heathen, he could do it himself. He didn't need us to go. And yet William Carey in his mind said, God's sending me. God's taking me there. God's directing me there. Now, folks, I don't think any of us should volunteer to be missionaries unless God called us to do it. But here's a man who's intense on serving, on ten, intense on answering the call. Forty-some years, William Carey served in India without one convert. I want to tell you that. Let me, let, me, let me say it one more time so you'll catch it here. That's important. 40 plus years, almost his whole life without one convert. Not one person accepted Jesus. Not one. 40 years he served waiting and being obedient to God's call in his life. But what happened when that one accepted Christ? The modern missionary movement was born. And out of that birthing, others began to hear the call to go to other places in the world. Others began to accept mission board appointments. And we as Southern Baptists even created a foreign mission board. And we began to have people that felt the call to go to places, and we would support them and send them. And missions began to go throughout the world. Do you know what the number one mission field today is for South Korea? Do you know where the South Koreans are sending their missionaries? Right here. Do you hear that? South Korea is the biggest mission field that they have is right here. Not among Koreans, but good old Americans. There's still a need to go. There's still a need to sin. There's still a need to encourage others to come. We sometimes waste our nets because we're living defeated. We're living as if God can't do something. That often leads to our depression. And our depression takes us further into our defeatism. And eventually all we ever do is mend our nets. And all that we ever do is wash our nets. 
And all that, we, all, all that we do is talk about when we used to go fishing. What changes that? How do we ever get out of that? One day, there was a need off the coast for those that would go to shipwrecks. And some guys got together and they volunteered and they said, we're going to be a soul-saving station. Our purpose will be to get in our boats and go as quickly as we can to where there's a shipwreck so that we can bring as many out of the waters as we possibly can. They had lights on their building that shined out into the harbor. They had radios. They got word when someone was sinking and they would rapidly run to the, their ships and they would get in those small boats and they would go out to that place and they would bring in those that were still surviving from a shipwreck and they, they just kept coming and going and eventually the shipping industry changed and the ships didn't pass that way much anymore. And so the need for their soul-saving entity began to become less and less important to them. And so they brought their ships, their boats out of the water and they placed them up for people to walk by and see what they used to do. They took all their equipment and they formed a clubhouse and they put all their equipment decorating the clubhouse and they would gather once a week in their clubhouse and they would sit around and they would constantly tell themselves stories about when they used to go out to sea. They would talk about the glory days. They would talk about when they used to fill their boats with souls that would have died had they not gone out there. And eventually, there were no souls being saved. I think sometimes defeatism is like that. We forget what our purpose is. We wash our nets. We mend our nets. We fix our nets. We hang our nets up on the wall. And we brag about the day that we used to put fish on our nets. And then along comes something that changes the direction of our lives. Simon hadn't invited Jesus to get in his boat. Matter of fact, he really didn't have an awful lot of information about Jesus. Who is this guy? He just, people follow him. We don't know, I have no idea who he is, but a lot of people are gathering around him. He seems to be a good teacher. And Jesus says, Simon, let me get in your boat and you come off the shore a little bit and let me teach from your boat. Let me speak the word of God from your boat. Let me use your boat, Peter. And hear that now. I'm, I'm ready. Jesus comes and says, it's now time for me to get in your boat. Okay. So he gets in the boat. I preached a revival one time at a service in Blythewood, South Carolina. And every night they had a unique something happen uh, that, they were, that they were doing. The first night was the night that I was standing in front of the baptistry and there was a big thunderstorm that came up. It was the only ser service that we had inside. And, and it was a little small church and worship was going on and I'm just preaching and I'm preaching and I'm preaching and lightning struck, struck the steeple of that church and sparks flew out of the baptistry. Everybody in the building got saved that night. I mean, it was, it was the best revival service I'd ever had. I, gave the, I stopped and gave the invitation. Everybody got saved. I helped them. I said, you see that? God's telling you something. You know, and boy, it got them all of a sudden. But the Monday night, I remember, they took me out to a little pond. And they said, you're going to preach from that boat. <laughs> yeah, right. No, really, we're going we're gonna to put you, we're all going to sit up on the shore and we're going to put you on the boat and they're going to row out a little bit and you're going to preach on the boat. That was the most miserable sermon I've ever preached in my life. It was, it was kind of like this. And then I realized sitting down might have been better. I can't preach from a boat. But here's Jesus saying, just, just put out a little bit. Let me use your boat 
to speak what? The Word of God. Let me use your church. Let me use your mission group. Let me use your band. Let me use your car. Let me use your voice. Let me use your clubhouse. Let me use anything that you and I might have available. If you'll let me use it just for a few moments, it might make the difference in what's going on. He preaches for a little bit, and then he says to Peter, let's go out to deep water. What's the significance of that? The crowd was on the, was on the bank. Won't you listen to me. This is important. Jesus doesn't want to spend all of his time in filled up churches. Jesus doesn't spend all of his time between those who have already accepted. Jesus doesn't spend all of his time just gathering around where people are worshiping. He wants us to go into deep water where there's a lot more fish. He wants us to understand it's not the numbers of people gathered on the shore that are important. It's the number of fish out there that haven't been caught yet that are important. Put out to deep water, Peter. I, I can hear Peter. I, 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 the, I'm glad they put it in movie form. Jesus... I don't know who you are, <laughs> but you're not a fisherman. It doesn't look like you've ever caught a fish a day in your life, but we fished all night. All night long, we've worked. All night long, we've toiled. All night long, we've done the stuff. There's no need to go to deep water. Listen to me. So many times we do the work and we work and we work and we work and we toil and we do and we complicate things and we just make it, we just do the work and we just do the work and we just do the work and all we're doing is repairing our nets and washing our nets and doing the work. But when Jesus come along and says, go to deep water, when Jesus comes along and says, let's go deeper. Let's go where we've never gone before. Let's move outside the place where you're comfortable. Can you imagine? I can't even begin to imagine what it must have felt like for Peter having Jesus in the boat, not knowing who he is. And Jesus says to him, stop right here. This is deep enough. Stop right here. Let me put it in my experience. I didn't think we would ever get to Buckhorn, Kentucky. We drove. The first time that Courtney and I went up there, we were on a dirt road crossing a mountain and thinking, oh my God, we've left the earth. And I kept thinking to myself, why here? Why in this populated area with 150 people in it, why here? I can tell you why here. In the last five years, we've baptized something like 30 people as a result of going into the deep water. As a result of going where God says, these people are prepared, I need for you to leave here, and I need for you to go there, because there is where the fish are. Are you hearing me? Sometimes we need to hear Jesus who says, let me take you where you've never been before. Let me take you to fishing holes that, that, are, that, are, that are still out there with lots of fish in them. J.L. Britt is our local fisherman. And I know that he can lie with the best of them when he starts telling fish stories. When J.L. Britt says, I went to Florida fishing this week, I turn him off right there because the next thing that he says is, I had a guide who took me where the fish were. He doesn't know where the fish are. He, he, gets, he gets in a boat and he goes where they tell him and the guy says, drop the line here and they drop the line there and they catch fish. But you know what? Peter was a fisherman. He got out there in the middle of the lake and Jesus said, throw your net right there. 
And Peter said, there's never, ever been any fish right there. Do you know how many times I've been out to this very spot? There's not any fish right there. And I bet you that there was a little bit of an argument that took place between Peter because I thought he was a strong-willed kind of person. And I think Jesus just said to him, Peter, put your net right there. Right there. Who's in charge of this fishing trip? And Peter drops his net. And he begins to bring in more fish than he'd ever seen in his life. So much so that they yelled to the other boat and said, y'all come over here and help us. We can't get all these fish in our boat. Isn't it amazing? They weren't going to leave any fish behind. Peter didn't say, hey, I only got room for about half these fish. I'll let the rest of them go. No, he had a catch of a lifetime. And he began to pull in the nets called the other boat said come help me and they're loading the boats with fish all of a sudden Peter realized who was in charge of this fishing expedition it wasn't Peter it wasn't him it was the man standing in their midst folks if you want to be amazed stop doing all the work stop doing all the stuff stop being satisfied at the end of the night that you did all these things and find your amazement in going where Jesus sends you and where he places you and where he says fish right here we baptized 17 people out of the Buckhorn project last year not a one of them attended evangelistic service not a one of them Went to a service where they played just as I am and said, come forward and accept Jesus. Not a one of them heard the four spiritual laws by Billy Graham. Not a one of them heard a faith presentation. Every one of them approached us and said, God's been working in my life. What did God do? God had already prepared the way. I want to tell you something, folks. While we're mending our nets... While we're talking about what we used to do and how we used to do it, and we just think that we're defeated, God's already getting the fishing hole prepared for the next excursion. God's already knowing where the people are. God already knows what we're going to do. God knows when he's going to call us, and he's going to say, take the boat and get ready to go. Don't us ever underestimate the man who stands in the boat. Don't let us ever underestimate the man who speaks the word of God. Don't let us ever underestimate the one who takes us into deep waters, cast our nets, and the boats are filled, not for our enjoyment, but rather for his kingdom. And he turns around to Peter and he says, you think this is good? Let me tell you about what fishing for men is going to be like. James, John, that other boat over there, got a job for you too. Y'all leave these nets that you've been working on all night long. Just leave them. You don't need them. Get rid of that stuff that you don't need. Get rid of that stuff that's occupied your time, that you are satisfied, that you call work. And let me just take you where the fishing holes are. Just follow me. The reason sometimes that we have so lost the evangelistic fervor is that the worship has become the object of worship. The instruments have become the object of worship. The songs that we sing have become the object of our worship. And we sit around our clubhouse and we talk about the good old days. And their souls drowning, waiting for fishermen to come waiting for people to interact, waiting for people to hear the call of God to go and to move into deeper waters. I believe that North River Baptist Church is on the verge of deeper waters. I don't know what that means for us. I really don't know that I can explain it to you in great detail. But I do believe that I'm watching God beginning to put together the tools that we need the things that we ought to have, and we're going to stop just doing the work, and we're going to start inviting and reaching out to those places. 
where we can fish in deeper waters. Listen to me carefully. That doesn't necessarily mean that we will fill our sanctuary with people. It does mean that we'll fill the kingdom of God. If the object of our evangelism is to fill our sanctuary, then we've lost our purpose. Our purpose has never been to fill the sanctuary. Our purpose has also has always been to enhance the kingdom of God. Close with this. Billy Graham in the 1940s was becoming somewhat of an anomaly. He was, he was preaching and people were gathering and he'd set up a tent. People would come hear Billy Graham preach a simple gospel sermon. But Billy Graham got in his head that what he wanted to do was to change people. And so he went to New York City and he preached there for six months in an evangelistic revival crusade. The object of his reasoning was, we will change the most wicked city in America. And at the end of six months, he considered that a failure. Because New York didn't change one bit. If anything, it got worse. But when challenged by that later on in his thinking, and when he began to write in his biography, he said, but it did change the lives of those people who found Christ. Maybe we need to refocus. It is not our purpose to change the world that we live in, but rather to save those who are sinking so that they might enjoy eternity. We get them in the lifeboat. We save them. We preserve them. Not change them for living in this world. We change them to live there. If you think that we're going to change our world by bringing people to Jesus, it will never happen. What you do is you change the world of individual people one by one. As you touch their lives, as you share your story, and as you stand in amazement. I can hear Peter now. Let me tell you about the time that Jesus took me fishing. And that amazing story was told over and over and over again. Folks, I, I just to touch the surface of the amazing stories that God has allowed me to experience in my life. I wish that we could sit down and just talk about them one after one after one. I believe in a God who knows where to fish. I believe in a God that can walk on the water. I believe in a God that can change a leprous man to a clean man. I believe in a God that is still drawing people into his kingdom. And he's doing that while the church continues to work on their nets. You understand what I mean? Churches just keep working and working and working. And Jesus kept saying, let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. Get in the boat with me. Let's go fishing. Wait a minute, our nets aren't prepared, are prepared yet. We've got to fix our nets. We've got to fix our problems. We tried fishing a couple months ago, and it didn't work so good. So we just got to keep making sure that our nets are okay. And Jesus is fishing in the deep water while you and I mend our nets. Dear Father, let us understand this teaching that from that moment on, you said to Peter, you're not going to be a fisher of fish, but you're going to be a fisher of men. And those men will be brought into the kingdom boat, heading to eternity. It was an amazing thing. And Peter stood there in amazement with the number of fish that filled his boat. And we can only begin to think about the countless souls that have been saved as generation after generation after generation have heard the stories from Peter's own life. We pray, Father, that we might become like Peter today. Be amazed in your presence and excited about fishing with you. For we pray it in Christ's name and for his sake.